friends, uh, we are starting this session a little bit late, uh, but still we will keep uh, give the presenters enough time. Uh, the way uh, my colleagues, through a conspiracy, I believe, have carved out the job of the, the chair is that the chair can do only two things keep time and tell the order, in which order the speakers are going Since I have to do only these two things, therefore I am trying to, I am going to do them very seriously. <laughs> so I request, I request the presenters and the people who later on will question to, to keep time in, in their mind. Each speaker will get 35 to 40 minutes and about uh, 25 to 20 or maybe 15 minutes for discussion. Uh, with that, I request Professor Kasturi Yunan to start his presentation. Thank you, uh, Rohit. I'll try to make sure that you stick to your promise. Um, I, it's wonderful to be here in familiar circumstances, uh, but in front of a un somewhat unfamiliar audience. I want to thank uh, Azim Prem University for giving me this opportunity. and. Um, this was a session which after we are done with our polished presentations, you will not realize that it has been put together only in the last week or so. Um, we have been working on, so Venu and I have been working on uh, understanding the relationship between cognition and uh, well-being for the last two to three years. And today's presentation is uh, uh, synthesis of three strands that I've been looking at for that time now. The first strand is that flourishing is a really good bridge between the study of the normative, the moral, uh, and the natural, right? So the biological in particular. That's one stream. The second is this idea which has been somewhat articulated uh, in the morning in Sundar Sarukai's talk uh, about uh, cognition and the importance of cognition. If you remember, he mentioned how Indian philosophical systems often take cognition to be a very central entity. And uh, I want to continue that theme and say that cognition uh, and this is where I want to uh, get Rohit all riled up, uh, is cognition actually can replace both reason and language as the central entity with which the humanity should engage with. Um, and the third that I want to uh, talk to you about, uh, putting on my um, geek hat, is the idea that the information sciences that are exploding now um, make us rethink the very nature of the entities that the humanities should deal with. So what I'm going to present to you is what I call the uh, sort of a view from the cognitive humanities. So in the sense that um, the humanities are, so it's not cognitive science, because cognitive science is supposed to be a science. I want to uh, articulate a position where we are still doing humanistic exploration, but both the theoretical category of cognition and the data from the cognitive sciences are central to this new way of looking at humanistic uh, thinking. That's really my agenda today. If I can get across even one of those three ideas, well, I'll be really happy. Okay, so um, let's start here. Right, so uh, Jerry Fodor, a very famous uh, philosopher, cognitive scientist, said that every idea has two lives. The first time in philosophy and the second time in cognitive science. Um, and uh, I think it's somewhat true. Uh, now I, I think there's a corollary to this. Every idea has three lives. First in philosophy, second in cognitive science, third in neuroscience, right? So if you are a young person looking for research things to do or you want to make a name for yourself, whatever you're doing, Put neuro in front of it, and you'll get a lot more money than, uh, than than what you're doing right now, right? So if you're doing aesthetics, do neuro aesthetics. If you're doing, uh, I don't know, you know, capability theory, then do neuro capability theory. So, okay, but uh, it's only semi facetious because there is a huge interest in the study of the mind and the brain these days, and it's not entirely a mistaken uh, preoccupation. So I want to start with flourishing, 
And what I want to get to is this notion that flourishing, which most of us see as a kind of a macro issue, right? What do you mean by flourishing? Um, in the morning, for example, in Professor Stephen Phillips' uh, presentation, he mentioned this idea of a rasa experience, right? So a deep aesthetic experience or, or, or um, maybe material success or uh, some kind of very uh, satisfying social life. These are the things that we think of as uh, tokens of flourishing. Right? So you are flourishing if you meet certain constraints. We may disagree with each other on what those constraints are or those conditions are, but they're broadly macro conditions. Right? So they exist perhaps at the time scale. So if I'm using physics or maths terminology, just uh, bear with me. But they, ex they are at the time scale of a lifetime or maybe at least a few months or years, okay? What I'm going to be prompting you, uh, which is a shift from the Aristotelian idea of flourishing, which incidentally is tied to, as you say, exhibiting virtue in accordance with reason, right? So the cultivation of virtues through reason is somehow central to this conception of flourishing. And it is through long-term training in that cultivation that we learn to flourish. And therefore, it's also conceived of as a very human thing, right? That the particular way in which humans flourish is through the cultivation of reason. So we don't, but there's another tacit understanding that we have that trees and leopards also flourish, but presumably they don't flourish through the cultivation of reason. Uh, and so one of the things that I want to allude to, I won't really talk to he about it here, is this new idea of flourishing might be not really a very anthropocentric notion and right and so therefore reason has a much smaller role to play in it than um, it did in the Aristotelian uh, conception of flourishing okay but you can imagine that education is the prototypical activity that leads to this cultivation of virtue and therefore the link between any idea of flourishing and education is very strong because the means through which we cultivate virtue will be the means through which we flourish Okay, uh, before I go to all of these, I want to um, come to the second theme that I've mentioned, which is the, uh, and, and it has been brought up several times today, about the nature of language and the importance of language in both in education and generally in philosophy, and the deep links between language and thought or language and reason. Why, um, why is that so important and what might a cognitive take on that give us. And I believe that cognitive science in the last 20 years has really transformed our understanding of language. And we are at a stage where uh, even compared to say 50 or 60 years ago when we looked at um, language as the primary entity, we might now be ready to take a look at cognition as the primary entity and language as something that reflects cognition rather than being a thing in and of itself. And that's, I think, a very, very important development. Let me give you an example. We, again, if you remember Stephen Phillips' talk this morning, he talked about uh, the village on the Ganges, right? And how it can't obviously mean, uh, or the village in the Ganges, if I remember right, that it can't literally mean a village that is in the Ganges River. Now, he talked about how those kinds of uh, uh, sense making can't are not accepted by the Nayayikas. It, this is something different, but independent of whether it's an acceptable form of knowledge or not, what I want to give you a sense for is how common this kind of inference is or this kind of thinking is in our everyday lives. I'm not meaning in some fancy poetry reading or uh, you know, in specialized circumstances. In our everyday lives, we use language in ways that actually mask very deep cognitive processes that are underlying it. So I'm going to use those very, uh, so I can say the house on the river, I can say the ship on the river, and I can say the, you know, the uh, wave on the river, okay? These three actually mean very different things, and you immediately recognize that. You know that a house on the river is really a house 
that is on the river bank or close to the river bank. If I say the ship on the river, you know that is at least prototypically, you would understand it as a ship that is within the confines of the uh, river. And when I say the wave on the river, you usually mean a wave on the surface of the river. So these three are uh, different ways of using the word on. You automatically understand what I mean, and yet there is, it's very, very hard to come up with a linguistic, a purely linguistic account of how these three uses mean those three different things. It's only through an account of cognition and our capacity to cognize different meanings creatively in context that we are able to do this. We are able to integrate the fact that houses and boats and waves are different entities and we bring that understanding into our um, meaning making in this case. Right? And this is endemic. This is actually how we um, conduct our li linguistic lives every day. And so part of what I'm trying to tell you is that it's not that whether it is the study of language or other aspects of flourishing, it's the study of these everyday moments where we might see some interesting new contributions from the cognitive sciences than at the macro level, right? So I I'm going to skip this slide because you've had this in front of you for a while. Um, one way in which people have been looking at flourishing in this slightly uh, more micro sense, or I call a meso scale exploration, is what's happening in fields like happiness economics or uh, behavioral economics, right? Uh, we know, so if you haven't heard this example, there's a famous example of the ultimatum game. So the ultimatum game consists of two people playing a game with each other. An experimenter comes and gives, say, 100 rupees to the first person and says, give the other person some percentage of the 100 rupees. If that person accepts your offer, you both get to keep what you have. And if the person rejects your offer, return, you know, you have to return the money to me. Okay, and it turns out that from a traditional rational expectations model, the experiment, the, um, the, uh, first, the person who got the money should offer one rupee. The reason being that he wants to maximize his returns and the other person should accept anything that comes to him because he has one rupee more than he had yesterday. Right? It turns out that most people reject the offer at numbers less than 35-40%. Again, it tells you that we are social animals and that our natural sense of what is fair and just regulates seemingly rational ex um, expectations, right? And again, if you look at it from the perspective of flourishing, you, if you want to create a society in which people flourish, you want these kinds of uh, game theoretic manipulations give us an insight into the, the fine-grained behavior of people in ways that maybe the more traditional philosophical accounts don't. So that, uh, I think, is very interesting. And you see this now everywhere. So again, just as if you add neuro in front of your thing, if you add behavioral in front of your uh, title also, you'll probably get a lot of uh, extra money. Uh, very interesting kinds of uh, experiments have been done, right? If you read uh, Dufflo and Banerjee's Poor Economics, you will see a lot of those examples. I'm not going to reiterate them. OK, what this doesn't have, however, is a theory of change, a theory of how actually people change their behavior, right? And that's where you need to get into the cognitive uh, end of things. So let me introduce this idea of micro-flourishing, right? So flourishing that happens just in a moment. It's not, so my claim is that instead of thinking of flourishing as something really huge, the Aristotelian idea of eudaimonia or some Indian counterpart of that of nirvana or moksha where, you know, life, the universe, and everything else, instead of think about flourishing as something that on the one hand, and as a cognitive scientist, you might want to say is something that we engage with and experience on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, and it is leavened by the immediate interactions that we have with others, that that is the basis of flourishing, okay? So micro-flourishing is flourishing that happens in one interaction. 
at the time scale of one second or two seconds, not, not at the time scale of uh, days, weeks, hour, you know. Right? And here I want to define flourishing in the following way. And I'll connect that to language in a minute, which is that to flourish is to respond appropriately to bodily circumstances. Okay? This might seem vague or nonsensical or completely unrelated to the earlier idea of flourishing, uh, but the point here is that as mobile beings, right, as, as animals that are um, where motility is one of our primary characteristics, flourishing is embedded within our capacity to orient and respond to our bodily circumstances. Okay? Uh, incidentally, a version of this is uh, central to the modern investigation of language. Uh, if you go back to Chomsky in 1955-56, he writes about how the central problem of uh, linguistics and the investigation of language is the what's called the um, free aspect of language use. Meaning, when I am asked a question or somebody comes and talks to me, so language is not just about the abstract knowledge of the rules of grammar or even the rules of meaning like what I did with those sentences with on in them. It's the ability to respond appropriately to somebody who asks me a question or know what to say where you are. So for example, I'm standing here and if I suddenly stop talking about flourishing and start talking about the election results that are coming out, then you would consider it a strange use of language, even if it was perfectly uh, semantically valid and grammatical, right? And so that idea that language use is appropriate to the circumstances, is free, it's not determined by the environment, and yet responds appropriately to the environment, is, has been very powerful. Unfortunately, it's not a question in which much progress has been made. And one of the great debates uh, that's happening in linguistics is between the um, Chomskyan style uh, rule-based generative ideas of language and what is now perhaps the most popular alternative to statistical ideas uh, that are coming from big data uses. Uh, so Google, for example, Google Translate is not so bad at doing what it does, but it's certainly not a rule-based engine in the way that uh, Chomsky and linguistics is. Right? And, and this is a huge debate. If you want, if you are a person who's interested in this, you should read Peter Norvig, who's uh, Google's chief of research's response to Chomsky's criticisms about it. Right? Go to norvig.org. I think that's where it is. Okay. So what is a bodily circumstance? It is the social environmental layout of the organism. So what do I mean by that? I'm standing here. There is a cognitive ontology, meaning that in my phenomenal experience of the world in front of me right now, there's a room, there are objects in it, and there are people in it. And so my social uh, environmental circumstance or situation has entities with whom, whose spatial layout is important to me, and different entities with whom I respond differently, right? So if there's a bag or a chair, I'll try to pick it up or move it out of the way. If there's a person, presumably I won't try to do that. Okay, and this is a very um, deep insight into cognition in general, but it was done in the context of perception by a, a perceptual scientist called J.J. Gibson. He said that really the point, the purpose of perception is to grasp the layout of the visual environment, okay? And I won't go very deeply into what that means. The next slide, I think, has a little bit of, uh, um, maybe two uh, slides. Uh, the next slide, the slide after this one has a little bit more about it. What's interesting about this kind of bodily circumstance idea of flourishing is that it brings, um, you know, thinking, emotion, motor activity all together in one unity. In the moment, when, whether you're speaking or thinking or just running away from a lion, it's not modularized. It's not as if you, phenomenally, right? So if you take first person experience seriously, what's interesting about first person experience is that emotion and cognition are not separate things. You may say that in the brain one is in one area and the other is in another area, but that's a 
uh, inferred uh, circumstance. In experience, if you take phenomenology seriously, you would have to understand that emotion and cognition go together. Okay, and it's only by abstracting from this bodily unity that you will get the different aspects. So, for example, reasoning as something that is sort of almost autonomous and independent of emotion is something that comes through abstraction. Now, again, if you went to Parimal's presentation in the morning, it may be that the abstraction is the right thing to do, but we shouldn't assume that that is the right starting point. Okay. So let me just give you a very brief idea of how a perceptual scientist might attack this problem of um, perception being, again, appropriate response to bodily circumstances. Okay, so just imagine there's a cube over there. It's multicolored. You can see the three colors in front, green, red, blue, right? Assuming that um, your uh, color receptors are okay. Um, Almost everyone in this room, I bet, has an instinctive sense that there are other edges, faces to this cube that are also colored. You would find it strange if this was actually a hollowed out shell that was just sitting out there. Right? That kind of knowledge, perceptual knowledge is built into you. And the reason is because we are used to walking around in the world and absorbing the sensory motor regularities that we face. So I go around here, and suddenly this lectern is in front of me. If I walk around, it'll be behind me. Right? These are tacit forms of knowledge that are part of how we are engineered as a species. Okay? And they are not in our head in some sense. It's not some computation that's going on in your head. It's really very embodied. It's based on the fact that you have you're a bipedal organism that sees the world in front, but not in the back. Okay? And this is a very deep idea which we are still struggling to really um, incorporate into our understanding of the mind. Okay? Sundar mentioned, right, we in the West and cognitive science as a discipline um, inherits this Cartesian dualism. And so we don't really know how to not be dualist. It's very hard. And it, it, it happens sort of sporadically, but then we descend back into that as scientists. All right? Um, I'm going to briefly mention uh, how to take these ideas of an active um, understanding into the study of language. And this is a work with Rola, who's here uh, in the back. If you want to ask her more questions, I'm sure you can. Um, think about an ordinary conversation. So you ask me a question, I respond. I might, um, so I'm not going to give away Rola's thesis, but, uh, uh, but the, the idea is that knowledge when is transacted in conversation, so for what we have talked about a lot today, which is the importance of testimony, what's interesting about testimony in everyday conversation is that it's not abstract. Somebody is convincing if they give the right affective stance, presumably I'm just convincing everybody here to drop what you're, whatever else you're doing and studying the mind, right? And, and the reason is because I am presumably a convincing speaker. It's not the content of my uh, thoughts, though that I'm sure plays a role. It's also the affective stance and the physical stance. So all of these come together in the way that knowledge is transacted in the real world. And so what I'm trying to say is that knowledge, especially even linguistically mediated knowledge, is not something abstract and whose um, qualities are only apparent through reasoning or through rational investigation. Now, somebody might say, this kind of knowledge is really hearsay, or it's not certain, or it is, it is suspect, or I don't trust it. How do I know you're right? And it's true. Philosophers will ask that question. Rohit will also ask that question, I'm sure. Right? But my question or response to that is, be that as it may, we still have to understand how human beings normally transact their lives, even if you want to abstract away from that and do something different in education. On the other hand, if education is really supposed to be a amplifier of our natural capacities, then we may have to do education very differently. Okay, and that's, that's really the take home message that I want to give 
to at least the people here who are interested in education, that the privileging of reasoning may itself be tied to some historical circumstances that are not universal. And that the way th that information technology is changing now, the primacy of the text and the primacy of reasoning as the model through which we engage with text may be um, more, uh, so, you know, I don't think it will be the primary way we engage with experiences in the future. Okay, um, young people already are doing things differently, right? And as I, as the line there says, instead of abstracting away from experience, we may have to use education as something that integrates experience into learning. How much uh, time do I have? Okay. So there is fortunately a theory of change built into this account of epistemology, right? So it's a dynamic epistemology rather than a static one. And which, as a result, certainty and truth are not as important. I mean, think about it this way. I mean, if I was doing some pop psychology, if you lived in a time where knowledge was scarce, data was scarce, and uh, books were hard to get, you may want to be really, really um, careful about how you draw conclusions from observations. But at a time when data is plentiful and memory is cheap, a much better way would be to make a conclusion. And if there is an error, you correct the error. And incidentally, this is the way animals generally behave. right? We, for example, you may have biases. If there is a rustling in the bushes, you run away. You don't really, I mean, if it turns out not to be a lion but your friend, then you come back. <laughs> it's not a big deal, right? Uh, so in that sense, the, uh, the intrinsic malleability of knowledge is built into, I think, our animal nature. It's not there in epistemology because epistemology had to deal with texts. Texts are not as malleable as our perceptions are. Okay. We know this, by the way, if you have done music uh, uh, coaching or learning or if you have done any sports, this kind of feedback based learning is central. Right? Um, we, we know that if you, so there are several kinds of rules of thumb that everybody here must have heard of in one way or that to scratch it out. So think of errors as not something that happen in your head. Think of errors that happen on paper that have to be scratched out or erased using a cursor and then um, corrected. Right? So this kind of error repair loop is um, not just there in um, you know, coaching and in uh, mathematics. It's also there if you have ever done mindfulness practice. Uh, it's a very common, I mean, the standard instructions for mindfulness practice are you concentrate on the breath and if you notice that your mind has wandered, just come right back, right? It's a very, very simple error correction feedback loop. And you can see that if you, if you do that for a week or so, uh, at least I've been told that your brain changes, right? Uh, and so, um, it, but this notion of a very simple feedback loop, which is built into repair and uh, recovery, is I think a robust sort of learning mechanism. Okay, and of course, uh, it's usually done best um, with a mentor. Okay, now I'm going to go into the third thing that I mentioned, which is that how does this all work in this new era of technology, right? Um, I, 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 this is work that I'm doing with a, another student of mine, Nishant. So one of the things that is changing now is the ubiquity of sensors and of ability to collect data in general, right? Um, we are now able, we can now build very simple devices, off-the-shelf technology, not that expensive, that can start collecting sensor data from your skin, from your brain. It's very crude right now, but even with very, very simple technology, you can now get feedback about 
um, attention. Right? It turns out that your uh, motor saccades in your eyes are among the more robust signals that um, your, uh, that are uh, captured by an EEG. Okay? So if, when you say your mind is wandering, it may well be that it's your eyes that are literally wandering. Okay? So if that's the case, being able to collect that data will give us really interesting ways of um, giving feedback on the kind of focus or concentration you have. You may think, and there are real normative questions here, or ethic moral questions about, should we be doing this or not? Um, and my gut sense is yes, but, uh, but I can see that there is an argument to be made against it. But what is important is that this data is now becoming available, and it will become easier and better as time goes along. And I don't mean like 25 years from now. In two years from now, we'll have much, much better technology than we have today. Right? And so um, this, when you have that kind of ubiquitous data, I think we don't, we'll no longer live in a world of text. So that's what, what I'm saying is that the humanities, which are the primary academic or scholarly means through which we engage with human experience, the primacy of text is because texts were the technology, so to speak, that we use to share experience. It's the most universal technology that we have had until now. And most of us don't even think about it as technology. I don't know how many of you have spent time actually learning how to make a book. Not write a book, make a book. Right? But, but there's a deep level of cultural understanding that you have. I once spent uh, a few months with my friend Grisha on actually putting books together. And it's a fantastic experience. And really, your understanding of books as something you read changes dramatically if books are something that you also make, like anything else. Right? And so, with these new technological forms, I think that we will experience ourselves and our lives in ways that books don't really give us. And, and I would say that in some ways, if you think of books as an abstraction of the world, instead we are coming to an era in which information is like a layer on top of the world. Right? To use the Sanskrit terms, um, it's essentially vyakti, right? It per information pervades our universe rather than being an abstraction or representation of our universe. And it's already there. I mean, if you have a mobile phone, um, you can, uh, I don't know, how many people in this room use Google Maps to come here today? Okay, there's at least one, no, five, four or five people, see? That's a, uh, so that's not a, so you can see that this kind of way of using information of information that's layered on top of our experience of the world rather than an abstraction is more or less a ubiquitous form of engagement. And in that world, the world which is mediated not by text, but by a layer of information that's actually co-present with the thing that you are informing, that's, I think, to me, is a very, very big shift. And it tells me that education, um, I'm going to skip that slide. Um, we'll have to contend with this. We'll have to contend with children and people who are used to information being everywhere. Not something, information is not something that you hoard, but something perhaps you search. Um, and, and I think that in that kind of world, what role does the body play? How do we orient ourselves appropriately to our circumstances, which was my definition of flourishing? These are questions that I think have very renewed urgency, but I think they can't be addressed using our traditional philosophical tools. I don't think I have those tools either, but I do think that ways of thinking about the mind and the body that we are now um, uncovering in the cognitive sciences might also be useful tools for understanding these sociocultural changes that are happening. And uh, so, even though I might have come across as either a cognitive reductionist or as a uh, techno-romantic, really my purpose is to convince you that it's the humanities that really will flourish and save us in these circumstances. Okay? So, information is ubiquitous. That's really my...
right? So what we are going to go through is a world in which there is essentially mobile and tactile learning, right? That is going to be one of the primary ways in which technology is going to change our lives. And which is another way of saying that culture is going to be more like nature than, than it was. Okay, so I'm going to stop with that and thank you very much. Now this is open for questions. We have about uh, uh, 15 minutes uh, for questions. One, two, three, uh, four, not, not you, behind you, four. Let's begin with four and when Rajesh responds to these four, then we will take you with the fist after in the next session. Yeah. I have a very quick question for you, Rajesh, and that is in terms of flourishing too. You spoke about it's being the most appropriate mm -hmm. organismic response to an environmental challenge. I mean, I think uh, flourishing one has something to recommend it. When you go back to eudaimonia, when you go back to nirvana, when you go back to samadhi, there was an element of joy. And when you hear the word flourishing, and any of the standard ordinary language uses of the word flourishing, surely imply a sense of, of joy, of exaltation. Mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, a kind of a, a high experience, a peak experience in Maslow's terms. None of that came through in your description of flourishing too. Would you care to comment on that? Okay. That's one question. Would you like to respond one by one or four, collect four and one respond? Um, uh, let's do two. Okay. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I actually wanted to ask you if you can explain a little more about culture being more like nature. Okay. All right. Um, let me... Can you hear me? Should I, I have this? Yeah. So, uh, the first thing, I agree that this is not an exalted view of flourishing. And maybe that's a good thing. Right? It's like um, there's a famous Zen claim, right, about what is nirvana and it is just chopping wood and carrying water. So maybe this is more along those lines. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, peak experience, I mean, one of the dangers of flourishing being seen through that kind of exaltation is that it sort of it leads to experience seeking. Instead, this is much more mundane. And uh, at the same time, I think that because there is some satisfaction involved in just doing the most elementary things. Uh, I think that there is a joy there too. And I, I, I think that the neurochemistry will probably bear that out. It did strike me that there was a sort of a zen minimalism yes. about your definition. Yes. Yes. Uh, the second question about nature being uh, more s similar to culture, what I mean is that we are um, ambulatory creatures, right? We move, we grasp and touch, and that's the primary way that we are built as biological creatures. On the whole, culture is not primarily about those things. It was not. You know, it's literature, reading, things that we love, or sitting in a room and listening to lectures. These are all taking us away from that primacy of motion and of touch. And I think that, uh, on the other hand, in the kind of technologies that we're building, which are about tactile surfaces typically, I think there's going to be more and more uh, engagement that is of that kind. Yeah, uh, and there's someone at the back. We are, we are still carrying on that earlier. Two at a time. Yeah, uh, one, two, three, four. Both is Ravi. Yeah, yeah, please. Hi, uh, my name's Jeff, Jeffrey Hinchliff. I'm from England. Um, I think that your um, description of Aristotle's uh, conception of eudaimonia um, could have been richer. And if you have a richer conception of eudaimonia in accordance with Aristotle's Nisimachian ethics, mm -hmm. then that gives you a toolkit to not only embrace modern technologies but also to critique them. So, for example, um, you mentioned um, that flourishing is virtue in accordance with reason. Mm -hmm. um, but what you didn't say is that for Aristotle, reason is also a practical activity in itself mm -hmm. through the use of phrenesis. Mm -hmm. And that also incorporates a judici judicious use of technical reasoning as well. Mm -hmm. um, it also incorporates 
um, emotions and what we would now call intelligent emotions. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and, fi and finally, it also assumes that eudaimonia can only take place within a community, and a community which is a moral community with a shared moral, uh, a shared human good. Well, once you have a richer conception of eudaimonia, it seems to me that then, that from the standpoint of flourishing, it then provides you with a, a position by which you can critique certain aspects of modern technologies, because some of some indeed a fair bit of modern technologies does nothing to promote fl human flourishing at all. It promotes um, isolation, solitude, and also it helps to promote obsessions, for example through continual use of, of, of um, um, play games and not to mention internet pornography. Um, so you can use Flourishing One um, to critique and to mount a fairly uh, um, uh, uh, a rich critique of um, some of the things that you were talking about. Um, and it's important that we don't just take on modern technologies hook, line and sinker. Can I just pile on? I have a comment that is very it, it, much... It is very short. All right. Um, I mean, he already made 80% of my points. Um, the other 20% is when Aristotle talks about flourishing, he means um, taming the vices. And um, taming the vices in, is very much a process of um, emotional, physical, embodied development towards moral excellence. So um, again, I think you had a fairly narrow reading of Aristotle. If you broaden your focus, you get into focus a lot of the things you were talking as point two or 2.0 under 1.0. Thanks. Someone was raising hand there. No, uh, yeah. was partly asked by this question. Okay, so. Um, my concern was really not with Aristotle at all. I mean, Aristotle was just, uh, to use a Sanskrit term, a purva paksha, right? So I, I'm not trying to say that Aristotle is either incomplete or complete. I mean, that's really not the purpose here. The purpose here was to ask what kind of idea of flourishing works at the time scale of one second. I mean, and you can't tell me that Aristotle either thought about that or has something to say about yes, it. Yes, he did. He said no man can flourish until the end of his life. He didn't say that no man has flourished until the end of his life. So you did think about that. No, but that's, that's exactly what I'm saying is sort of a macro conception. I'm saying that a very different idea of flourishing is the ability, for example, to just pick up this bottle. That is, that is the level at which I think we can and should study flourishing now. Now, maybe you use a different term. If, if it's a semantic issue, then that's a different issue. But I think that it's continuous with what Aristotle was interested in, but it's at a scale and at a granularity that would have been very hard to study seriously 2,000 years ago. Yes, and then Yeah, I was, I was going to ask whether you would consider well-being mm -hmm. as sort of something that you could use interchangeably with flourishing. That was one question. Mm -hmm. And the other was you used the phrase cognitive humanities. Mm -hmm. And I was very intrigued by that. Could you elaborate? Okay. One more, right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is, a, I guess, a comment or question on behalf of the education folk. Uh, I mean, in the, in the hope that this remains a two-way conversation rather than a parallel one or a one-way conversation. I think, that, so I'm a little, I find this a bit discordant that you, in your talk, you have quite a rich uh, description, a presentation of the role of experience mm -hmm. in action, in knowledge, uh, the, the, you know, the, to, the complexity of experience. You mentioned Chomsky. Mm -hmm and the free aspect of language is sort of tagging on to mm -hmm. experience with freedom. Mm -hmm. While at the same time you seem to endorse an approach to mathematics education, mm 
which we all recognize as drill and practice. I, don't, I doubt if uh, you would find many educationists subscribing to that view. So I'm wondering what's uh, the reason for this. I think that the reason is that there's not enough flow of the conversation. I mean, I, of course you'll find educationists who believe in drill and practice, but I don't think that's a view that uh, many people hold, at least here. Um, let me try to address both of those issues. Um, your, so let me start with the, first, the question about uh, cognitive humanities. What I'm trying to say there is, instead of thinking of cognitive science, which, is, which tries to be a science and which is increasingly being talked about in biological terms, or in reductive biological terms, neurological terms, instead of doing that, think of the modern technologies and uh, means that we have of collecting data, about, both about first person and third person experience. Um, can that enrich our understanding of the humanities? That's really the claim here. So for example, uh, just as texts have been so central, we now can easily imagine a world, and we live in it, where video is almost as central as text. You know, um, I wouldn't be surprised if half the people in this room watched more YouTube than read anything, right? And so, um, I, it's not necessarily a good thing. I'm not, but, you know, these are cultural shifts and we have to understand what's happening. And I do think that multimedia is becoming central to our lives in a way that um, it wasn't before. So how do we incorporate that new medium? And I think the cognitive science or the cognitive techniques have some role to play in incorporating that. So that's the first thing. The, I'm gonna to go to Ravi's question about uh, kind of drill and kill uh, type of uh, learning. Uh, I'm not encouraging, that was just an aside, so I, I really shouldn't uh, put my foot into my mouth that much. Uh, but I, I think that there is a, there's a importance should be given to repeated practice. Now, how practice is to be done? Is it? I don't think the kind of practice that we see in um, you know exam preparation these days is the right kind of practice. But there are other kinds of practice. So for example, if you want to learn how to program computers well, and it's a very creative discipline, or do mathematics well, you have to do a lot of practice with your hands. And that's really what I'm trying to encourage, that it's not that even mathematics or programming, which are seen as uh, abstract disciplines, still need to be done repeatedly in a tactile way. That's really what the message I wanted to give. Not the particular form in which it's reinforced right now. You know, but, but if you understand Tamil, right? Like my dad will still ask me, and I, he's a Kanak Potya, right? So which in, in, in uh, translation means, did you do your sums? Or did you, so I, I think that there is some insight there. There's some insight there. Uh, okay, you can sort that out in the tea. <laughs> so two more people, one and then Srikanth. A very, please short and sharp he questions. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, in 2.0, if you want to define flourishing as a moment-to-moment -moment thing, mm -hmm. and if you want that to be the notion of good life, mm -hmm. uh, how do we uh, accommodate something like planning for your life in this? Well, um, it turns out that, oh, okay, actually, let me... Uh, do you want to? Any, let's do one more question. I just wanted to understand what the role of reason was within this idea of flourishing. Because for me, personally, reason is a way, whether it is text or YouTube or big data, it doesn't matter. Reason is a way for me to see through propaganda of different kind. I may be fed a lot of propaganda through YouTube or the big data, right? How do I cut through that? How do I? And for me, reason is that capacity irrespective of what the form of information is. So what is the role of reason in flourishing and how can we, I mean, I, I got a sense that you're seeing a lesser role. How is that possible? Okay. Um. Let me start with the first one. Um, planning, I think, it turns out that 
people are terrible at planning, by the way, uh, right? I mean, the, the experimental data bears that out. And in a dynamic world, uh, planning is often a very bad thing to do. So, uh, incidentally, the people who have learned this lesson best are people who build robots for a living. Because a lot of early AI was about plans that are executed perfectly. Because they assumed that a good machine would be able to say, okay, I need, no. Instead, a lot of the learning that has happened has been to say that, yes, there are, there's a need for maps and blueprints, but they have to be integrated into this kind of um, uh, feedback loop, right? That's the, so because without that, it turns out that systems that have long range blueprints guiding their everyday activity are very brittle. So for example, imagine a navigation system which had perfect maps and blueprints and everything and you always had to go from, let's say from um, uh, here, so which is Matikere to, uh, you know, Electronic City, but you know how it is in Bangalore, there are like zillions of uh, interruptions, roads will be dug up, you can't plan for that. So either you need to change your conception of planning and which people are trying to address how that can, those kind of mixed models can be created. But a plan that is pre-decided and exists sort of almost independent of other things, I think is a very brittle affair. That's, that's my opinion, uh, anyway. Uh, and uh, Srikant, your question about reason, see, you see, I mean, you can use the term reason however you want, right? But you, if you have to sort of probe that a little bit and you ask, how would you see through big data using reason? You have a problem because if that was to be done, let's say, only using statistical methods, which is broadly, you know, the rational methods that we have at hand with big data. Um, there's a very beautiful website called Spurious Correlations. Okay, it turns out, for example, that the number of homicides in, uh, I don't know where, in the US, has a 0.91 correlation with uh, the amount of margarine being eaten. Okay, so this is very robust, large, big data. So you might, you might say, what, where do you get, where does reason give you an instinctive way of saying this, there's something wrong here. I don't think it's a rational, I mean, if you expand reason to include all of cognition, then of course it's a rational response to say, no, there's something spurious about this. But what is much more actually the case is that we as human beings have a sense for what is likely to be a genuine correlation and what is not, so that eating margarine is unlikely to be correlated with homicides, right? Uh, so my sense is that what you are calling reason actually falls into what I'm calling a kind of more embodied reaction. So um, unless we define what reason is and what the other terms are in affect and so on, I think that my gut level response to you would be that what you're calling reason already has emotion, for example, built into it, right? So. Well, thank you very much. No, we have to stop. We have another presentation which will be even more exciting. So please save your questions for that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and with that, I uh, invite.